Good morning, you guys. How are you today? Doing good? We, we, we made it through the tropical storm, didn't get washed away. Um, so, hey, we're doing good, right? Every day above water is a good day for us. So, um, hey, be, uh, before we uh, kind of jump into things, I want to take a moment just to uh, pray for uh, Church of Motion uh, in Sarasota, Pastor David. By the way, they're doing great. Um, they have, they're up to, matter of fact, uh, within a few months, they're going to be breaking uh, over 200 people uh, per uh, Sunday that they're, that's a part of the church there. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And I just, wanna, I just felt led to, to just lift them up today, so let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace and, and Lord, that your, your power in our lives. And we get to live our lives, Lord, not in our own strength, not in our own wisdom, but Lord, living from the overflow of the fullness of you being in our lives. And we thank you, God, for the life that is happening at Church of Motion. We thank you for Pastor David. We thank you for Brooke. We thank you for all the people there, God, that are just affecting their community in the most beautiful ways. God, may you continue to fill them uh, with your life. May, may they continue uh, to grow and prosper and discover exactly what it is to be the church of motion, the church that you've called them to be in Sarasota. God, bless them. May your presence be felt there and may lives be changed there continually, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody says? Amen. Amen. All right. So, um, uh, I don't know about you guys, but you know, sometimes I think if I were someone uh, moving from a foreign country to the United States and English wasn't my primary language and I was kind of listening uh, to what's going on in the national discussions and trying to figure out what the United States is all about, I think I would be pretty confused, right? I mean, I mean let's face it, we have never been more socially and technologically connected, but more relationally disconnected from one another, right? And it's like everybody's talking, but nobody's using the same language, right? It's like everybody's saying something, but nobody ever feels heard. And so, um, you know, because of some of the social um, problems that have really risen to the surface, um, we, we, we've heard in the national discussion people saying, hey, black lives matter, and for a very good reason, that became a saying that was repeated over and over, and people really believe strongly in that. And then you had another group of people that said, well, all lives matter. So they were saying all lives matter, thinking what we're saying is everybody matters, but if you were saying black lives matter, what you were saying was you're not saying the same thing that I'm saying. And a person that says all lives matter says, no, no, I'm saying the same thing. I'm just including everybody. But, but then you're saying, but, but you're not saying black lives matter. So because you're not saying what I'm saying, you're really not saying that I matter. And you're trying to say, yes, you do matter. And then someone else came along and said blue lives matter. <laughs> right? Talking about law enforcement because of the real danger that law enforcement is dealing with in the loss of life. And so they're saying blue lives matter, which sounds like to the people who say black lives matter, you're not saying that black lives matter. We're saying we're not saying black lives don't matter, we're just saying blue lives matter. And the people saying all lives matter say, no, no, we all matter, and both groups are saying, we, you don't understand what we're saying. Right? So we, 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 it's like everybody's talking. Everybody's lips are moving. But nobody feels like anybody understands them. And nobody, under, nobody feels like they're being heard because we live in a, in a world and in a society that is so fragmented that where, where people are in groups and people are digging into their, their, kind of their own uh, foxholes and, and everybody's talking, but nobody's really communicating and nobody's being heard. And, and this isn't a modern problem. The, the, the idea of different groups and you're in and you're out and no, we matter and no, we matter, that is something that has always been a part of the human condition. It's been a part of the problem with mankind for so long. And as we, as we continue our series today talking about the Holy Spirit, today I want you to open up your heart to a greater vision, to an understanding that there's something powerful and supernatural that God has wanted to do and has been doing through the Holy Spirit that is meant to bring healing to these issues in our world and in our society. And that you and I play an important part in all of this. And there's something, a dream, a vision that has driven God for so long to fix what is broken in our world, when everybody's saying different things and nobody feels heard and this group is in or that group is in, and what is the solution to all that? Well, I'm going to take you today to 
a passage that for some, they get a little scared when you start talking about the book of Acts and Acts chapter 2 and the Holy Spirit. But I want you to see a passage that if you've been a believer for a long period of time, you probably have seen this passage, but you've probably seen it with the different eyes. And today, I want you to just open up your heart to what it is that God is looking to do and through the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to take you to Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to walk you through um, this passage. And this is so full of so much that, uh, that I, did, I just want you to, to, to follow along with this. So Acts chapter 2 says, On the day of Pentecost... All the believers were meeting together in one place. Now, stop there. So before this even happened, Jesus, after he had paid for all of our sins on the cross, had been buried and had been raised from the dead, he told his disciples, he said, you guys, you go and wait. You wait for the gift that I promised you. You're not going to do anything. You just wait. And so they're there together, and they're waiting. So the, the time it says that this was happening was Pentecost. Now, now, some of you, when you hear Pentecost, you think Pentecostal. When you hear Pentecostal, you freak out, okay? And, and, it, and it's too bad, because Pentecost literally only means 50. That's what it means, 50. <sighs> Scary, I know. So <laughs> Pentecost is 50 days after Passover, or 50 days, if you're a believer, after Easter, if you're a believer in Christ, 50 days after Easter. And for the Jews, when they celebrate Pentecost, it's the remembrance of the giving of the law, the commands. And so you know the scene, and you can go back to Exodus chapter 30, you can go back to Exodus chapter 2, and you can see all this stuff. You see, Moses goes up to the top of Mount Sinai, God gives him uh, the law, the commandments, uh, he comes down. Uh, from the mountain, and w when he comes down from the mountain, he's walking into a really bad situation. Now, now you can get this if you go and check this out on the movie. You guys ever see Moses in the movies, right? You got to make sure you pick the right movie, because it, ta-da, so if you, if you pick uh, Mel Brooks' History of the World, what that looked like was, he's got three tablets, and he says, I give you the 15 commandments. One falls out of his ar arms, breaks, and he goes, I give you the 10 commandments. <laughs> Wrong movie. you got to watch the one with Charlton Heston because then you discover what Moses really looks like. Amazing hair, amazing beard, <laughs> blowing in a wind. You know, that's, that's the picture you want to get. So he, he comes down from the mountain, and, and when he comes down, the people are, uh, is, everything is going to pot because what's happened is they were waiting so long for Moses that they're getting impatient. And so Moses' own brother, Aaron, he goes, hey, uh, yeah, give me all your gold. And they get, bring his, their jewelry. He melts it down. He makes a golden calf. And he goes, behold your God. And so everybody's like starting to get drunk, starting to, to just go crazy, uh, party. And this is what Moses walks into. Now, when Moses comes into that environment, what happens is, um, of course, God is very angry. He's been dishonored. He's already, they're already turning to idolatry. And a group uh, from the tribe of Levi are really upset about all the idolatry that's going on. And, and God literally executes judgment upon that day through the tribe of Levi. They go through and they kill everybody who's been involved in idolatry. 3,000 people died that day. And because of their zeal for God, the Levitical priesthood is established through them. And so it's kind of a, a mixed thing, but it was like this was the giving of the law. And so the, the Jews from all around um, the nations, they've come to Jerusalem in order to celebrate Pentecost, to commemorate the giving of the law. The Christians are there as Pentecost because they've been told, wait for the gift that my father is going to give you. And so here's what it says, that they were all together meeting in one place, the believers, Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. So this thing is loud. It doesn't say there was wind. It just says it sounded like a tornado. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. So little flames, you know, about that big, like a tongue, was a fire. God was manifesting the presence of the Holy Spirit by allowing tongues of fire to appear and settle on them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit 
and began speaking in other languages as the Spirit gave them this ability. Now, don't get all hung up on, on tongues. You've got to see bigger. So he says this, at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. Why? Because it's Pentecost. When they heard the loud noise, so it wasn't just the sound wasn't just in the house. People in the neighborhood, people in the area could hear it too. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. So the Jewish people that had not believed in Christ are hearing Gentiles, or excuse me, hearing Jews that are followers of Christ speaking in their own language. These people are from all over the place. Check this out. It says they were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, which didn't just mean they're from that area. It was kind of a, a, a blow, too. It was kind of like, yeah, these are Galileans. These aren't smart people. How can they be speaking all these languages? They're all from Galilee, yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans, so there was room for us there too, right? Cretans, we're there. And Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this, this is great. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming, Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. We need a little more time if that's going to happen, right? It takes time to get there. This is way too early. So clearly it can't be that. He said, no, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. Here's what the, the prophet Joel had written. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. That is, they're going to speak forth the glories of God. They're going to declare uh, who God is and the words of God. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will all or, and they will prophesy. So it's not just a guy thing. It's not this patriarchal outranking kind of thing. He's like, no, this is, this is my move for everybody. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. They will, the sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, Theologians have kind of gotten all, you know, worked up on this passage. Some are saying, well, so is this saying that it's everything that Joel said? Is it saying that part of what Joel said is happening? Is, it, is, this, is this that? Is it like that? Is it part of that? What, what is this? And here's what you need to understand in all this. Is that what God is doing is he's coming with the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's doing this to, because he's doing this work so that everyone who calls on him will be saved. Now, what does it mean to be saved? That's a very, uh, kind of a church term. When we talk about being saved, when the scriptures talk about it, it means several things, not just one, it means several things. At the very least, it means this. Number one, since Jesus Christ died on a cross and paid for your sins, since he was buried, he died, he was buried, and has been raised from the dead, it is because of what Jesus has done that, that in taking all of your sin and all the blame for your sin upon himself, that you could be forgiven by God because somebody has paid your penalty for you. It means you could be completely forgiven of all your sin, past, present, and future. That God wants to remove all of that so that there's nothing between you and him. At the very least, salvation has to do with that, but, but salvation isn't only that. Salvation also means freedom. 
It means walking in freedom. It means having a power in your life so you can now live differently. It's, it, it, it's so, so you're being saved not only from your sin, you're being saved from the power of darkness. You're being saved from yourself. But it means all those things. And he says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So God is changing lives and he's saving people when they call on his name. Now, the Jews were like, what is going on here? And so Peter will give them a speech, and he'll talk about, hey, you know that Messiah that you've been waiting for, that one you've been waiting for, your, the one that we've all been waiting for? Guess what? He's the one you crucified. And, and God has declared him to be the son of God. He's raised him from the dead. He is alive today. And the Jews were like, oh, wow, we killed our Messiah. What can we do? What should we do about this? Peter replied in verse 38, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. You've got to change your mind about the way you think about God and the way you relate to God. You've got to change your mind about the way you live your life. You can't be the boss of your life. You've got to bow and surrender to Jesus. He is the Lord. He's the Son of God. And so he says you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is available to you too. Check this out. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Now when you see that little phrase, including those who are far away, something inside of you ought to jump up and down and say, wow, I am so grateful for that. Because here's what he's saying. Look, it's not just for the people that I'm talking to. It's not just for the Jews. But it's to the people that are in the future. It's for the people that are Gentiles. It's for the people that have had no connection with God. It's for everybody that God is calling. It doesn't matter how broken their life is. It doesn't matter how much of a mess their life is. This is for everybody. And so he says, this is, this is and, and who's, who's, who are those far away? Us. That's us. And look what he says. He says, then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Now remember, this is Pentecost. The next verse you don't have in your outline, but here's what it says. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to their church that day about 3,000 in all. So, why does God send his Holy Spirit? Why do we need the Holy Spirit? What is it that God wants to do? Number one is this is he empowers me to live righteously. He gives, he sends the Holy Spirit because he empowers me to live righteously. What does it mean? What is righteousness? What does it mean to be righteous? Here's what it means. Do what's right. You do the right thing. You do the right thing for people. You do the right thing in God's eyes. You're righteous because you do what's right. That's what it is. Not complicated, right? Not always easy, but you decide to do what's right. Here's the problem. is you know, many of you came from, uh, especially with deep religious backgrounds, oftentimes there was so much of an emphasis on the rules, the commands, and the regulations. And no matter how hard you tried to do what is right, you kept realizing, I can't do this. It's impossible. And so what God does is rather than give you more rules and regulations, is instead he gives you his spirit. The Holy Spirit literally comes into your life to change your heart, to change your desires. That's why he keeps saying, I will pour out my spirit. I'm going to give my spirit. That's why they said, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because there's no way that you can live the life that God wants without his power. In Jeremiah 31, verse 31, you guys can write that one down. You'll see that God promised ahead of time. He said, I am going to put my spirit in you. I'm going to give you a new heart. Why? Because it's impossible to live righteously without the Holy Spirit living in us. And it's, it's been, so here's what it is. It's not about God telling you more things what you're supposed to do in. Well, I'm going to try harder this time, and if I just try harder this time, then I'll be able to live righteously. No, you won't. Because you need the Spirit. So the Spirit of God comes into your life, and what he does is he changes your heart. He responds to you. He changes your heart. So now you, his laws are written on your heart. His, his commandments, what's right is in you. 
And so now you're doing what's already in you, not being controlled by an external rule, but by an internal impulse to do what is right. And that's how the power of God works to live righteously. Paul puts it this way in Romans 8. He says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And so the true meaning of Pentecost is that God wants to change you from the inside out and empower you to live righteously. Now, sometimes people go, well, how come I don't experience the power of God then? Well, that's a great question. Because a lot of people don't experience the power of God because they've never had any intention of living differently. This is why he says, repent. Repent. Repent and be baptized. Repent. Turn away. Decide you're gonna, you want to live a different way. You need the power to live a different way. You've got to repent. You've got to turn from God. See, what sometimes people do is they go, yeah, I want fire insurance. I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to believe in Jesus because I want fire insurance, but I don't have any intention of changing my life. You don't need the power of God for that. God won't give you his spirit for that because he's not interested in adding, you adding him on to what you've already decided you're going to do. That's why he says, no, 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 you've got to surrender. You've got to die. And then my life will come in and take root in your life. But so many people never experience the power of God because they never have any intention of living any differently. I mean, you don't need a Ferrari if you're not going to go and take it out on the highway. If you're going to leave it parked in your garage, you don't need it. In the same way, God won't give his spirit if somebody has no intention of changing, a new, going into a new direction. But when somebody says, God, I need a new life. God, I need you to change me from the inside out. Oh, he's all in on that. See, God's not interested in being your fire insurance. What he's interested in is bringing his fire into your life to change you. Supernaturally. That's what he wants to do. And so he empowers me to live righteously. Here's the second thing he does. He empowers me to live supernaturally. So that I no longer have to depend on what I understand and what I can do. You know, when we do our services, we, 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 we pray, we, we pour creativity into it, we, we, we ask God, I'm praying all the time. Your worship team, is before you even come in, they've already prayed over, the, over this place. I've prayed over this place Saturday night. I'm just saying all week long, God, I want to say what you want me to say. And then we do what it is that we do, but what we do is we learn that we, gotta tr- we trust in God, his, super, his supernatural power to change lives. And it's not on us to try to change your life. We learn to rely upon God to be able to do that. And so you don't have to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. You learn to rely on the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example. So some years back, we did a, we did a Sunday service where we piled a bunch of stones, big stones, up on this platform. And I taught um, about Abraham. And Abraham uh, was called to sacrifice his son, if you remember, on an altar and, and it was a really big ask that God was giving him, and it was a demonstration of his faith. And when everybody came into the church that day, what we did was we gave them a stone. We said, this represents that hard area of your life, that thing that you have a hard time letting go of, that area in your life that's, that's really difficult for you to trust God with. At the end of the service, we had people come up, and, and everyone could just take their, the stone that they had, and whatever that represented in their lives, and they could drop it and put it on that on that on that uh, altar is what it was supposed to be. The next day, I get a phone call. And the guy says, you don't know me because I don't go to your church. But I was there yesterday. My wife was out of town, and uh, I can't drive for medical reasons. And so uh, my friend who goes to your church, he said, hey, let me bring you to my church today since uh, you don't have a church to go to uh, or you can't get to your church. So let me take you to mine. So he came. He, was all, he sat through all that. He was, he was a part of all that, and here's what he told me. He said, here's what you didn't know. He said, that rock, that hard place for me was my son. He said, my son got in a car wreck a year ago, and he's been in a coma ever since. He said, when, when you gave that invitation, I came up and I put that rock up there, and I said, God, I'm going to trust you with him. He said, no, this is Monday, he called me. He said, today... He started talking for the first time. Isn't that amazing? You see, you can't plan that stuff. 
all we do is we learn to rely completely on God. We do what we do because creativity is an expression of God as a creator. That's why we do it. And so we learn to rely completely upon God. And you can live supernaturally with God when you, you simply walk with him. Here's the way that the Apostle Paul said it. He said, and my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. It's why when, when people come up to me, if they say, oh man, you said something that really changed my life, that really, it doesn't, it, I, I don't really receive that. But when somebody says, man, it was like God was talking to me today and here's exactly what he said, then I know that you're hearing from God. Because I'm relying on the Holy Spirit to take what I say and to speak to you wherever you are and God does what only God can do. And so he empowers us to live supernaturally. You never have to rely only on what you understand and what you can do. Here's the third thing. This is huge. This brings it all together. He empowers me to fulfill his mission in community. In community. Listen, the Holy Spirit and, 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 and allowing the Holy Spirit in your life, it's not about, you know, chasing down God goosebumps, you know, going from one experience to the other. It's not what this is about. There's so much something so much bigger that God was doing because what God was doing was he was taking people that, that didn't even speak the same language and now he's giving them the ability to understand one another. And people are being heard and they're all saying the same thing and it's all about God. It's all about the power of God. It's the way that God is changing their lives. And something really powerful happens when God is reversing what is broken in the world when people come together with the power of God. It changes things. Not only was he reversing what happened in, in, in uh, Pentecost when 3,000 were killed, 3,000 got saved. Not only that, but if you go back to Genesis chapter 11 and the Tower of Babel, you guys know the story. When, when God was causing everyone to not be able to understand each other, they began to speak in different languages so they could no longer conspire to do evil. And God was, God was trying to put the brakes on the, on the decline of man. And so this coming together and suddenly understanding was God saying, that's being reversed. I'm doing a new work. No longer are people dying, but now people are coming alive. People are finding life. No longer are people in that group or that group not understanding each other, but people can understand one another. There's a unity that I'm bringing in and it's supernatural. And it happens when you open up your life to the power of the Holy Spirit. It happens when you surrender. And when God takes a group of people that are all declaring what God has done in their lives and he brings them together, something beautiful happens. Take a look. In Acts, uh, chap continuing Acts chapter 2, after all this it says, and all the believers after this Holy Spirit came met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper. And they shared their meals with great joy, generosity. All the while, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And as they're in this community, as they're, as they're doing life together, as people who have had their lives changed, gathered, even in the smallest of groups. Take a look at this. It says, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Something supernatural happens. When believers get together, when they're able to celebrate what God has done and what God is doing, and what happens is God brings people then into our midst, into your midst. What, whatever, that, whatever your small group looks like, whatever we look like, and when we together are enjoying God, lives are getting changed. And God will continue to send people that, that need to hear your story and need to find freedom. See, those pictures, joy and generosity, you know what that is? That's a picture of freedom. That's a picture of people who, have, I'm not afraid. And everything I have, God supplies. 
and I love you. And we love one another. And see, it's not just about I love God. No, it's about the love that God brings for one another as well. And it is a powerful, powerful thing. Of all the places where people ought to be able to find someone who can understand them and someone who can speak the same language, it's the church. If there's ever a place where the supernatural power of God can flow, it's when people who know Jesus Christ get together. Listen, I cannot encourage you enough. The reason we talk about small groups so much here is because it really is the place where people can find freedom. And God keeps sending people where there's that life, where there's that common language, that common praise, that common experience of the power of God. He just keeps bringing people in because he knows that their lives are going to be changed, that they're going to understand something they've never understood before, that they're going to come alive when they're around you. For some of you, you, you go, why have I never experienced the power of the Holy Spirit? Here's the question. Did you ever surrender? Did you ever really repent? Or were you just adding God onto what you were already doing? He wants to be in your life, and he wants to pour out his spirit. For some of you, that means trusting Jesus Christ as Savior, really trusting him, and inviting him to come into your life with his power. Repent, be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is for all of us. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Why don't you let today be the day that you settle once and for all who really gets to run your life? Why don't you let this be the day that you really surrender? Yeah, that means something's going to change in your life but it's because you realize there's something so much better, so much more compelling, and so much more powerful that God has for you. And if you've never opened up your life to Christ that way, then I want to give you the opportunity right now. And right where you are, you could just tell him, Lord God, I repent. I need you to come into my life and to change me from the inside out. I want you and your power to guide my life and to guide my desires. I don't need religion. I need you. And so, God, right now, I give you my life. I surrender. I believe you are the Savior and you are my Lord. You do in my life all that you want to do. Thank you, God. And Father, I just thank you for the life and the power that you offer us. God, that we don't have to act religious. God, we don't have to beat ourselves up with rules. But God, you've opened up a way that is so life-giving to simply allow you in our lives to bring forth the beauty that you want to and to create the kind of community that anybody, no matter what their background, is going to be able to find someone who's going to have an effect on them and, and, and be able to love them and their lives are able to be changed because of what they experience supernaturally right here in our midst. God, may your, may your presence be so strong in every small group. May your presence continue to be strong here on Sundays. And Lord, may you continue to pour out the life that you want us all to experience. We thank you, God. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, guys. Let's tell God thank you, guys. Thank you, Lord.